also want to give a shout out to our projectionist, Charles Mosser. Thank you guys. That was amazing. We got through it. That ran beautifully, Charles. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just gonna, I gotta compliment someone up there. We have Charles Massa, who uh, has been doing film all around town. He built Spielberg's screening room, the DGA. He worked with Frank Sinatra for 30 years. He's 87 years old, and you can't see him, and he is up there, and he made sure that projector worked. So give it up for Charles Massa. Thank you, Charles. So now, uh, guys, thank you so much. We've got the screenwriter. That movie was straight up dope. You've got some little water right there. Uh, give it up for Larry Block and Larry. It looks like you have something to say, so I'm gonna let you say it first. This is kind of like one of the weirdest trips of my life because uh, you guys were really quiet. I was expecting people screaming and throwing stuff at you know popcorn at the, at the screen, and uh, so I, you know I, I'm hoping you guys enjoyed it. Yeah. If you can, you have to check it out. Uh, Sound. One of the most special things about the movie was they did something very innovative. They made a decision not to do any of the surround sound until you were in the front house. So it was like a really, really uh, powerful juxtaposition. When you're, once you're in the front house, it's all around you, the sound, everything is pumping all around you, and it's supposed to be very, very effective. Anyway, that's the one thing I, I think that uh, Andrew Laszlo, who's the, who's the cinematographer, uh, he's probably rolling over in his grave because it's a beautiful film. It was shot in anamorphic white. Who had shot the Warriors, right? What? He shot the Warriors. He shot the Warriors. He shot a whole bunch of very famous movies. And then uh, Bor Rabinowitz, uh, who was the set designer, that was all, you know, everything that was designed in the fun house, he designed everything in that because there's no fun house really quite like that. And. Uh, but to see that, like a widescreen, or to see it on Blu-ray DVD, and I think there's like two versions of it that are out. One is by Shout, and I forget the other company. But it's really worth seeing it in Blu-ray. Uh, Daniel, do we have Daniel on? Are we video? Great, perfect. Okay, I know we want to thank you. Um, so, guys, I want to go to your questions. I just have a few, and then we'll go. The first thing I want to do, because I forgot to do this, is I want to shout out Martin and June Glass, who I guess you met in line a few weeks ago, and they told me we were doing this. So, uh, Martin and Julie, thank you very much, because uh, they got Larry to write me, and I wrote Larry, and, and Larry, thank you for, for being here. My, my first question for you is, um, I guess I'll just start simple, which is, so how did the script come about? Did you write it and then Toby Hooper read it or did you work on it together? There's a lot of misconceptions about it. Uh, I was, uh, it was very early in my career when I was pitching stories at uh, Eddie Barna Layton Productions. They did a lot of westerns, uh, but they did one horror movie called The Challenge the World, which is a super low budget, really funky movie, but, really, but anyway, we were in between uh, pitches, and uh, they introduced me to Toby, and he had just come out from a pitch, and I was waiting to go in, and they were taking some notes, and so I met him, and he asked me, like, you know, with that great Texas accent, and he so, uh, what are you all working on? And I told him I had this project called The Fun House, it was gonna be a, and I was in the middle of doing it, I had a, a couple of weeks to work on it, and uh, he said, well, great, hell, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see it, and you hear that a lot, but he gave me his number, and uh, I finished the script. I got it to him, and he actually read the script and um, loved it. He got Mark Lester to put up a thousand dollars to option it, and it's really crazy. And uh, Mark Lester uh, somehow knew Derek Power, and Derek Power, who was one of the producers, uh, had just been uh, jo joined the team of B and B Productions which was Harvey Bernhardt and Mace Newfeld Productions, and the other ones who basically got in and, and brought it to Universal Studios, um, and that's how it happened. One little interesting side note, uh, Toby at one point said he wasn't gonna do it after all, he had some kind of another commitment. They brought in Joe Dante, everybody know Joe Dante? I worked, I worked with Joe Dante, it would have been a very different film. Yeah. I worked with Joe Dante for like maybe a, three or four days on it. 
Um, he actually came up with the idea of Joey jumping down and, and, and trying to join them. That was not in the script before that part. And uh, that was basically it. And if you don't mind me asking if you do, just tell me to have fun. You, you still look very young. I mean, how old were you when you wrote this script? <laughs> I wasn't that young. I was like 30 years old. So. That's, that's, I'm 42. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, one thing that, that it seems is intentional in the movie is there's a lot of these references to universal horror movies. There's like, you see Frankenstein, he's in Frankenstein, you see Bride of Frankenstein. There's sort of that fun opening right. where you think that it's the brother and he's just scaring you. And it's, right. did, did you guys, were there any conversations about what you were going for? Was that just, we just loved those no, movies? It, it, it always happened. I always had the Frankenstein poster uh, in, 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 the, uh, in, in the Joey's room. I always had, had a bunch of weird shit in the place because that's how I grew up. That was what my room was kind of like. But I didn't have the, uh, the chains. Uh, but once Universal signed on and did, did it as a negative pickup, they decided uh, oh, we're going to yeah. milk it. So we own the rights to Frankenstein, the Bride of Frankenstein, and that's how that happened. Got it. And uh, I'm going to ask one more question. If you got questions, we always prefer it to be audience questions. But I always have questions if you don't. So, um, so I, you know, another question we got to ask is, what was Toby Hooper like to work with? And do you have like a favorite story from the shoot that sort of for you just says Toby Hooper? Well, a whole bunch of you know, this was very early in his career. He had just finished uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He had just done, uh, he was doing Salem's Lot. And he was a protege of Billy Freakin. And he was totally, he loved Billy Freakin, you know. But, you know, it, this was really early in his career still. And, uh, but I do, I do remember a key, a couple of really funny things with him. Uh, we missed our flight to Miami. Oh. He was supposed to pick us up, and we missed. We, we, you know, we had someone to pick us up. We missed the flight, and uh, I remember waiting. In, this is before TSA and all this other stuff. But I remember like waiting in the airport online to get another flight because they were supposed to fly us out first class. And all I hear him speaking with his assistant, right, saying. What do you mean you didn't get the VCR? Get a chainsaw and cut the fucking thing open! And he's screaming this out like in the airport. I mean, it didn't mean anything. The other thing was, when, they finally, when we finally landed, they picked us up, and um, he was upset about the limo driver because it was a, it was a woman in a, in a limo outfit, and uh, she had his name spelled wrong, where she was saying, like, you know, Toby Pooper, Toby Pooper. He got really pissed off. <laughs> And so we're in the limo, and we're now driving to Norton's studios, and, and he's just sort of like going at her. He's just saying, like, I never heard of such a thing. We pay for a limo, and this is what we get. And all of a sudden, she pulls the car over, the limo over. She says, get out! <laughs> and, get out! And he's trying to sweet talk her, and it doesn't work. And she let us off on a bridge somewhere. I don't know where the hell it was. And then, and then, we, uh, and then they sent another limo. Uh, he was very nice, he was very charming. Uh, I was there for 10 days of reproduction. He came up with a whole bunch of new ideas. They wanted me to get out of the production because it was slowing things down because we had some really amazing ideas and other things that were actually in the script that, uh, that, that didn't make it into the movie. Uh, but he was a lot of fun. Uh, I, I, I kept pretty close contact with him for a couple of years. I remember one night he calls me up at like 10.30 at night and he says, I have a meeting with John Peters. We want to do this, uh, we want to do this uh, movie about a uh, college suicide club. And it turns out that it's a murderer. And he's like, I don't have time to, I don't have time to read the book, so can you read the book? <laughs> come, come take the meeting with me, make me look good, and you'll have the gig if it happens. We met with John Peters and he was just like really charming. And, Every time Peters would ask him a question, like, I, told, I told the story. He would say things like, oh, it's a really interesting question. You know what? I'll have to think about that and get back to you. <laughs> the, uh, the, so, you know, you're watching, you've got some great actors in there. You've got Sylvia Miles, Absolutely. Kevin Conway, yeah. Elizabeth Barrett would go on to be Mozart's wife and Amadeus in just a few years. You got William Finley. You're from Phantom of the Paradise? Yeah, I'll tell you a funny thing yeah. about William Finley. Yeah, yeah. I was in the room with Toby because we hadn't cast him yet and we were in, we were in Miami. And 
and so I was in a room with Toby, and he's, uh, he's on the phone, he calls up Bill Finley, and, and he's, hi, how you doing, Toby? Great, great. He goes, ah, I want you to be in another one of my movies. He goes, well, it's not like the other ones, is it? <laughs> no, 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 it isn't. This is like really classy, this is like really different. <laughs> and, he, and, no, and, and Finley basically says, can you read me some lines? And I'm sitting there, and he's reading, Toby is reading the lines to Bill Finley, and Bill Finley on the other line is basically saying, okay, I'll do it. He was great. <laughs> the, the, so anyway, questions, Mom, well, just leaving my card. Does anyone have uh, quite Yes, uh, right there in the back. Uh, yeah, so I think there, uh, I think it's my first time thinking about it, but I'm going to use that My script, when I was finishing up that script, this, this, were, you know, this is really a tough time. I was just breaking into the business. And uh, when I, I, I knew that it was going to Toby Hooper, and I really admired the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, so I understood a lot of his sensibilities, and that's a, the reason why I think he really went for it, was because this whole thing about family, the, yeah. the, the being a family, and, and the sympathy that was like sort of like built in for the, that, that whole situation. Um, but that's there. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was in the script. I know there's a lot of misinformation about what was done and what wasn't done. But um, I do remember one, one, one of the scenes that Toby said we have to do is we got to do something else with the father and the kid relationship. And that's when I came up with this thing that we call like the confession booth, which is, it plays like a confession booth. And I remember writing it and then we didn't have cell phones in those days. So I had, a, I had to call the lines in and they were transcribing them. That entire scene between uh, when the father uh, is trying to convince the son that he's got to do one more bad thing, and I remember what I, I think you guys enjoyed it. My favorite line in the whole piece is when he says, "And afterwards, we'll go fishing like this." <laughs> well, I was so I'm really glad you pointed that out. I didn't want to say it at the beginning for people who haven't seen the movie, but there's this thing in, in Texas and in this that gives it an edge over other horror movies where there's this familial relationship where in some ways the father is the bigger monster than the son. And you sort of watch it, and but that was just something you were sort of writing for Hooper, you thought he'd go yeah, for that. I, I, know, I, I, knew, I knew what his sensibilities were, and uh, again, we had a blast. I was there like for 10 days in pre-production. We had an absolute blast coming up with gimmicks. There's a lot more stuff my only regret about the movie is because they ran, they ran a little bit over budget and over time was we had incredible choreographed chase scenes going through the funhouse where Amy was basically losing her mind and it becomes hallucinogenic. I mean, it has a hallucinogenic feel to it. There are some people who say, oh, how could it be such a big you know, funhouse and all that, but by that time, you're like, she's out of her mind. So uh, that, that, that's my only regret. They had Verna Fields come in as an editor. It's one of the top editors in the university. The editor of Jaws? Yes. Whoa. And she came in and was able to figure out a way to make it, to give you the illusion of this incredible chase through the uh, fun house. But I had things where he runs headlong into one of the uh, figures and it cracks open and there's a skeleton underneath and you realize that a lot of these things were actually, uh, were actually one time they were people. So, other questions? Yes. Uh, how did Universal treat you? Did they did they uh, like what you were doing? Did they were they happy with the movie? Uh, were they proud of it? Uh, Universal uh, did it as a negative pickup, so they pretty much let Mason Newfeld, who was a very big producer at the time, and he had done The Omen and, and uh, the, you know The Omen and a couple of other great and all and all the Harrison Ford movies, and he continues to actually work in the business. Uh, they kind of like left us alone. Uh, there is an interesting story about the book. I don't know if anybody knows about the Dean Koontz book. If you read the latest edition, uh, he speaks quite in depth about what actually went on there. Uh, but Universal owned uh, Joel's books, and they're the ones who launched Dean's career as, as uh, Owen West, and they didn't treat him very nicely. As a matter of fact, I, uh, I wound up speaking to Dean, and when I took I, I didn't. We, we didn't realize until like eight years later that it was Dean Koontz who wrote, was, was, wrote under a pseudonym of Owen West, who did the novelization. Anyway, I just remember calling him up and I got through, through, you know, through his agent 
and saying, well, you know, they're going to reissue the book now. Because the book did very well the first time around. I did, I did more money on the book. I made more money on the book than I did on the film. But when they went to re reissue it, it was with Dean Kuntz's name on it. And that was worth a fortune. And they tried to get me down. It was like horrible. He told me, you know what, kid, I'm not going to let them do this to you. He's, he, I wound up with two and a half points in the Dean Kuntz book. We became really best friends. <laughs> that first check that came in, we were really hungry at the time, it was like $119,000. And it's for the book, which I had nothing really to do with. He novelized it. And uh, over the course of my career, I, you know, it's like, it, it was very good. I made over a quarter million dollars on the book. And I kind of think that uh, Universal was very upset with me. If you read, if you read the last, uh, the latest uh, uh, reprint of The Fun House, he explains it very, very succinctly. We became very good friends anyway. Uh, how was I treated by Universal? Uh, most writers are not treated that well. Uh, and, uh, but he was a great kid.